Well, good morning. I hope your weekend's treating you well. We are entering the second week of the Lenten season, starting today, and we begin with Jesus in the Judean wilderness, which we talked about last week, kind of just summarizing, questioning his identity and purpose, knowing that that's the same human struggle that we have. And I talked about that we are designed to prevail against forces that unite against us, right? This is our story. And this week we're going to explore another fascinating scene where Jesus was moving toward Jerusalem. He's like on a multiple city tour from Galilee to Jerusalem, and he gets a little resistance in between. But he knows what his mission is. He knows the why, right? And so nothing's going to stop him. That's where we start. He knows what his mission is. And what, it is, what is his mission? Healing people and bringing the kingdom of God to earth. Like, that was his mission. He said it a whole lot. So we wouldn't be mistaken. So speaking of missions, it reminded me of something this week. Did you know, this is kind of interesting, on their last mission to the moon, NASA actually set up a restaurant near what is the Copernicus Crater, I guess, is what it is. Isn't that weird? Why would they do that? Uh, But unfortunately, I guess it didn't actually make it. Um, I guess the food was good, but the atmosphere was... Not there. Sorry. Sorry. Did I sell that well enough? Oh, yes. (laughs) Okay, so Jesus is on mission, headed to Jerusalem on the way. He gets a bit of a warning. He's on his way. And we turn to Luke 13, 31, and it says this. At that very hour, some religious leaders, some Pharisees, came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. See, Jesus is on a mission, right? He's headed to Jerusalem and on the way. This is where we're at. Herod wants to kill you. See, Jesus was threatening the powers. He was threatening to the powers and principalities, specifically the royal power in the head of Jerusalem, King Herod. So, He moved closer and closer to Jerusalem, and he faced resistance. Haven't we all faced resistance as we're moving toward our mission, our purpose, whatever that might be, the thing we really want, the goals we have? This here is Constance Baker Motley. She was 15 when she was turned away from a public beach because she was black, and it sparked her interest in civil rights at that point. So, She already figured out her why at the age of 15. After obtaining her law degree, she went to Columbia Law School, and she represented none other than Martin Luther King Jr. as a young lawyer, and she became a law clerk for Thurgood Marshall. She took an interest in politics, and she was the first black woman to serve in the New York Senate. Pretty powerful. Imagine the resistance that she had. Her political career, though, was cut short because she became the first black woman to be appointed federal judge in 1966 by Lyndon B. Johnson. She passed away in 2005. She had just turned 84, and Motley found her mission. Motley found her mission, her why, and no forces against her would prevail. So, right, we all encounter resistance, and she encountered a whole bunch of it, but it seems knowing our why provides the strength and courage to overcome. It seems that matters a whole lot. Jesus knew his why. He was unwavering. Nothing was going to stop him. We learned that in the Judean desert, all the temptations for influence and power. So, the Pharisees in Luke 13, 32 said this, Oh, I'm sorry, they didn't say this. He said, go and tell them, because the Pharisees warned him, right? Herod's going to kill you. Go and tell them, go and tell that fox for me. (laughs) I love that. Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way. I must be on my mission because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jesus had business to take care of. Go and tell that fox. I love that line. He was unwavering. What was he doing? He's healing people, and he says he was casting out demons. 
And I wonder, like, why did casting out demons have a significance? And we can turn back to Luke eleven twenty. In Luke eleven twenty, it says, But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Casting out demons probably signifies more than a literal casting out of demons, Right? It's a common phrase to say, you know, I've been exercising my demons. You know, whether it be addiction, mental health related, depression, anxiety, temptations, you name it, right? And where did freedom happen? When those things, when those things were cast out. But it's by the finger of God that I cast out the demons and the kingdom of God has come to you. When we find freedom from any of those things, it's a saving act isn't it? We all know. We're all human. We've all experienced those things, some of those things, and we've all experienced what it's like to be finally free from those things that hold us down. And Jesus was about that business. He was about that business of helping people get free. There's redemption on the other side by the finger of God. The kingdom of God, though, what is that? Like, what are we talking about when we talk about the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus said, you know, we're talking through the Gospels, and Jesus just says simply, it's forgiveness, it's mercy, it's peace, it's grace. That is the kingdom of God. Where that exists, the kingdom of God exists. When we find freedom, we experience the kingdom of God. And I think what's neat about this is we don't go find the kingdom the kingdom comes to us. Uh, it says that, right? Then the kingdom of God has come to you. This was Jesus' mission, mission on earth, to bring the kingdom of God to everyone. And as he reminded the Pharisees, go f- tell that fox I'm busy. As he reminded them, he shows this deep-seated compassion. So we turn to Luke 13, 34. This one gets me. So he's, he's getting closer to Jerusalem, and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Mm, how I often have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. Mm. I just feel the sadness as he says this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And he says it again right before Palm Sunday. He says it again as he's going into Jerusalem. He just says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you only knew essentially what you're missing, what you've been missing, I want to gather you together. Mm. If we want to know what God's like, we look no further than Jesus. He laments over war in our hearts, right? He laments over thirst for power and control. He laments over hardened hearts and unwilling spirits. And I see this unending desire to bring the world under God's peace, love, mercy, and forgiveness. Like a hen gathers her chicks. What a beautiful picture. You think that's a beautiful picture? I love that. Is that what God's like? It must be. It must be. Back in 2013, I I went to a conference in Gwinnett County, which is a suburban county of Atlanta. I went to a conference there, and a pastor of a local church shared something that I truly will never forget. He called their mission for Gwinnett. So, for Gwinnett. You'd see it all over social media, hashtag for Gwinnett, uh, whatever. But it just caught me. It caught me so hard because I realized what other mission do we have than being for the community around us, for the life of the world? And they pulled this from Jeremiah 29, 7, right? Jeremiah 29, 7 says, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you in exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. I could read that. I need to see that, that verse every day when I walk out of my house when I come into this building, when I go out into the community, seek the welfare of the city. Mm. 
And so for this church in Gwinnett County, it became their mission. It became their purpose. It became their identity. And it still is because you go online, you look up their social media account, they're still for Gwinnett. And it's all about it. They know what their business is. They know their why. Mm, I love it. Since Jesus lived his life, gave his life, and came to life for the life of the world, so will I. That's it. (laughs) That's the mission. Since Jesus lived his life, gave his life, and came to life, so will I for the life of the world. And that's the mission, everything in the name of Christ for the life of the world. And so this is why I absolutely love what we're doing on Tuesday. Oh, man. I need that in my heart. I need to be a part of something bigger than myself. For the life of the world. For the life of Green Bay. For the life of Grace of Salvation Church. For the life of Ukraine. For the life of St. Joe's Catholic School. For the life of our community. For the life of this church. For the life of you guys. That's why I love opportunities to go into the community and offer mercy, grace, forgiveness, and love, and actually share with folks in our community. That's why I love what we did last summer, Imago Day, knowing that people are made in the image of God, and we went into the park, and we had a service, and we actually got to say to people, we are for you, not against you. And you know what? A lot of them hadn't heard that ever from the church. And one man came up to me after the service was done and he said, I've held so much hostility, pain, and hurt. And today, I finally feel free. For decades, This man lived with just pain and hostility about the church because he thought the church was against him. And he said, today, I finally feel free. Is there not anything more that we need in life than to experience that type of freedom, than to be a part of people getting free? Because where freedom is found, we find the Spirit of God and we find the kingdom of God. And I was just so excited to think about that story again this week. And I was so excited to share it again. Finally free. When the forces unite against us, when the forces unite against the church, when the forces unite against you, you can say, go tell that fox I'm busy. I got a mission for the life of the world. For grace of salvation, as I saw them on Sunday night and we set up the lights, they were coming in to the church. And they were so appreciative that we set up the blue and yellow lights. A simple, simple thing. And they had smiles on their faces and they had ideas. And a guy named Sam said, I'll help you get the lights on the steeple. I've been up there before. I was like, great, because I might not make it if I do that. And it was just so cool to connect with these people, because they are us. They're not they. We are the church. We are this community, and this is the mission of Christ, right? Yesterday, today, and forever, this is our why. And when we know our why, we have strength and courage to overcome that stuff. Oh, the forces that unite against us, because this is our story. And I want to finish with this quote from a Christian activist, a very well-known Christian activist, Dorothy Day. And she said this, when you love people, you see all the good in them, all the Christ in them. God sees Christ, his son in us, and loves us. And so we should see Christ in others and nothing else and love them. There can never be enough of it. There can never be enough thinking about it. Amen. Ah. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you lived, you gave your life, and you came to life for the life of the world. 
in the incarnation of your son, Jesus Christ. And I just, I know that there's more of that. I know there's more freedom. I know that there's more life to be lived. And I just pray that every day when we wake up, we think about how we can be Christ for the life of the world. In your heavenly name, amen.